And welcome to Professor Chirukuri and his family. Um, uh, it, it really, really thank you to Professor Chirukuri's family for sharing him with us. He has built a solid global reputation based on his own hard work, but no academic success happens without family. And so we always honor family on a day such as this, because we know that there are many, many hours that he invested in his career, and the family had to share him with us. So let me welcome the family especially, and say we're delighted not only that you're here, but also for sharing Shadrach with us. It is my pleasure to introduce you to my colleagues on the platform this evening. I'm your host, of course, if you don't know me, my name is Mamu Kheti Pakeng. I don't expect you to be able to spell the name or or even pronounce it, let me tell you, unless you are a Motswana or, an, or speak Afrikaans or Hebrew, it's very difficult. <laughs> so anything close, it's okay, except for Tswanas, Hebrew, Jewish people, and Africans people. Uh, and I'm currently serving as Vice Chancellor of UCT. We have the Dean of Science, Professor Manu Ramutsindela, who will introduce the speaker tonight. And our inaugural lecturer, Professor Shadrach Chirukuri, he's Professor of Archaeology in the Faculty of Science, is our speaker for tonight. And professor Colette Dandara is in the Division of Human Genetics in the Faculty of Health Sciences, and he will deliver the vote of thanks at the end. Also joining us, uh, I was hoping that the, vice, the Deputy Vice Chancellors will be here, but they are, of course, keeping the fires burning. I left Professor Ferris attending to an urgent matter in the, in the building, so he's not, she's not here with us today. Professor Chirukuri's lecture, is very pertinent to UCT's celebration of Africa Month. It is about Africa's rich history and its influence on our current self-image as a continent. This is an important discussion because for centuries, the Western world denied that Africa even had a history. The late British historian, Professor Hugh Trevoropa, said in the, 19, in the 1960s, and I quote, the history of the world for the last five centuries, in so far as it has significance, has been European history. Perhaps in the future, there will be some African history. But at present, there is none. There is only one history of the European in Africa. The rest is darkness, and darkness is not a subject of history." Close quote. Tonight, Professor Chirukuri sheds light on some of those dark corners the developed world did not want to see and did not care for us to see about ourselves. His work addresses not only the hard evidence of Africa's dynamic past, but also how we teach ourselves about ourselves today and how we can better inform ourselves as we look to the future. This is an enlightening and most welcome lesson in the discussion at UCT and other universities that we are having here at UCT and other universities about curriculum reform, the decolonial movement, and perhaps most importantly, how we as Africans see ourselves. I now welcome Professor Manu Ramutsindela to introduce Professor Shadrach Chirukuri. Thank you, uh, the Vice Chancellor, for, for the introductory remark. And um, my duty is simply to introduce the speaker for tonight, um, Professor Shadrach uh, Rigure. Um, I just want to give you a bit of background on who he is. <clears throat> um, he started his academic journey when he studied for a BA General and a BA Special Honours in Archaeology at the University of Zimbabwe. Um, at that stage, he, he got the best archaeology student of the Millennium Award in 2001. He moved on to do Masters in Artifact Studies in 2002 at the University College London, and he passed that Masters degree with distinction. He then enrolled for a PhD in archaeology at the University College London, which he passed without um, any amendments. And of course, he had other qualifications, uh, BCom, financial analysis and portfolio management, and diploma in labor management um, from the Institute of Personnel Management. 
Of course, he's also a family man. Um, he's married to uh, Geraldine Dooley, and he has got three sons, um, Tawana, Tadana, and Tafara. If you can't remember the, son, the names, they're triple T's. Um, he is well published. Um, he has published over 100 journals and book chapters. Um, he has five books, including co-edited volumes. Um, he is involved in a number of projects, and I just want to single three of them. Um, the first one is the Orange Moon Shipwreck Project, uh, where the research involves 28 kilograms of gold coins. I've just checked with him. He has none of these with him. 20 tons of copper ignots, seven tons of unworked elephant ivory. I was anxious about ivory because he could be arrested if he has any. He is also involved in a project uh, on Great Zimbabwe, um, which involves the rethinking of Great Zimbabwe using local philosophies. And for this work, he won the prize for the paper that was published in one of the top journals in the field antiquity. The other project that perhaps describe what he's doing is Africa's pre-industrial metallurgy, where he surveys um, the technology and anthropology of Africa's um, pre-industrial metallurgy. And from that project, he has published a book on metals in past societies. Um, Shadrach is somebody who has earned um, many honors, and I just want to select a few of them here. Um, he, he, he has a fellowship of the Association of Commonwealth Universities um, at Oxford University. And here at home, he is also UCT College of Fellows, um, young researcher, for which he got an award. Um, he is one of the founding members of the South African Young Academy of Science. Um, and of course, those of you who, reads, who read the Mail and Guardian would have noticed he was one of the top 200 South Africans. Um, he serves on the advisory board of uh, the Vernon Grant Foundation for Anthropological Research. More recently, he is serving as editor-in-chief of the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of African Archaeology. He's also a senior editor of the Oxford Research Encyclopedia of Anthropology. Um, he's serving as a member of the Board of Governance for the Arts Council of the African Studies Association. And he's also a committee member of the Society for American Archaeological Book Award Committee. He is currently serving on at least nine editorial board members for journals. Um, more recently, he was appointed British Academy Global Professor, um, which is an initiative of, um, which, which is an initiative we selected, you know, sort of the best professors that can hold that position. So we're very proud, um, especially in the science faculty at UCT to have a global professor. Um, he has delivered several keynote addresses, and more importantly, he will deliver the 31st McDonald Institute of Archaeology's annual lecture for 2019. <clears throat> and the lecture is the most prestigious highlight of academic activities in archaeology at the University of Cambridge. And today, he delivers this inaugural address. I want to invite you to deliver the address. Thank you. Uh, so I begin. Uh, a good afternoon from the flight deck, your captain speaking. <laughs> Welcome aboard this flight and uh, fasten your seat belts, relax, and hope you will enjoy your flight with us. When I was asked to give this lecture, I was uh, nervous. I still am. But uh, what I decided to do was to phone a colleague to uh, solicit uh, for some uh, tips. So at the end of a 15-minute uh, discussion, I asked my friend, so what do you remember from your own inaugural lecture? And then he said nothing. 
So <laughs> here is where this is going. <laughs> At the end of the next 30 or so minutes, if you remember nothing, blame my friend. <laughs> However, if you remember something, I take the credit. <laughs> uh, colleagues, friends, and family, uh, this is um, Africa Month. So I would like to uh, start by saying that uh, may uh, the Lord uh, bless uh, the uh, African uh, continent. I would also like to um, thank um, my uh, late uh, parents, who unfortunately did not live long enough um, to see uh, my uh, academic uh, progression. Um, I would also want to thank a number of uh, funding uh, agencies, um, some of whom are um, listed here, for uh, supporting uh, my work um, over, the, over the years. Um, I would like to um, pay um, a huge uh, thanks to my own department uh, here at UCT, um, the Department of Archaeology, uh, the Faculty of Science, um, as well as the uh, University of um, Cape Town uh, for their uh, resolute uh, support. I must also be um, honest to say that I have uh, received quite a lot of support uh, from many uh, colleagues, uh, friends, uh, and as well as enemies. Um, <laughs> I cannot uh, name uh, all of them uh, today, so I will just uh, uh, pick uh, a few. If I don't uh, pick your name, please um, just know that your contribution is uh, very uh, important. So here is um, a famous or infamous gang of five, you know, that um, collectively and at different uh, points in time conspired to you know, influenced me to become the archaeologist uh, that I am uh, today. Uh, Professor Gilbert Quitty, uh, Professor Tilo Ren, who was uh, my doctoral supervisor, and um, the late uh, Professor P.J. Uh, Ako. Um, when I joined uh, the uh, Department of uh, Archaeology, I formed a very strong uh, bond of uh, friendship with um, uh, Simon Hall, and I remember at times, you know, spending uh, over three hours um, debating on structuralism. I gave up when I could not uh, convince Simon to renounce structuralism. <laughs> then um, there's also uh, Professor uh, Judith Seeley, uh, who was um, an HOD, a mentor, a friend, and um, a very uh, honest um, critique. So all of these uh, colleagues and others, and I must also mention uh, Dr. Munyarad Manyanga, that uh, also traveled all the way uh, from um, Limpopo North. Um, if you are lost, some call that place as uh, Zimbabwe. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in as much as um, I have received uh, help uh, from uh, colleagues and, um, and assistants, I must also acknowledge that I've had a share of uh, uh, trials and, um, and tribulations. So one of my sons uh, who is uh, seated here at the front, at some point um, I said uh, to his mom, hey mom, why does our father live on the aeroplane? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> which is just uh, a consequence of the effect that, you know, perhaps um, the archeology span that I do is away from Cape Town. So one has to uh, travel uh, all the way, which um, leads me to uh, a tribute to a very uh, extraordinary uh, person, very generous, uh, very intelligent, and uh, who holds our, our family uh, together. So to uh, my wife and partner, Geraldine, uh, thank you so much. And I must also uh, make another uh, confession it helps to be married to someone who is more intelligent than you are. <laughs> you know, you have no idea how I benefit. <laughs> and uh, also these are... <laughs> so these are also our, 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 three, our three sons. And uh, we thank God because they keep us uh, quite, uh, quite busy and, um, and challenged. So the other time I was asked to solve um, a mathematical equation 
And I said, no, I have no idea. So the response was that, oh, dad, but you are a professor. What do you teach? <laughs> <laughs> so Tawana, the vice chancellor of the University of Cape Town, um, knows maths better than daddy, you know. <laughs> OK, uh, now that all protocol has been uh, observed, <laughs> Uh, I would like to ask you to um, join me uh, on, a, on a walk um, where we are starting um, right here in the present. We take a step uh, into the past, we come back to the uh, present, and then maybe uh, try to see what the uh, future uh, holds. So the uh, main idea that I'm going to be uh, talking about is that um, the foundation of the discipline of, um, of archaeology uh, is uh, or was within uh, the realm of um, uh, treasure hunting and uh, people who were looking for, for fun. But over the years, the field has, uh, has evolved. But the, um, the way I see it is that uh, it hasn't uh, shaken off uh, some of um, those um, things that people say, well, this perhaps is um, a serious contribution to um, the development of our modern day uh, societies. So what I'm saying is that um, as archaeologists, we must go beyond um, business as usual to produce a locally centered knowledge uh, that is a problem solving and uh, at the same time are globally uh, competitive. So for the remainder of the time, I will be uh, using examples uh, to uh, illustrate uh, all uh, this. Then, the key question then is, um, how many amongst us wanted to be archaeologists uh, when they were growing up? Certainly not me, and not my, and, and, not my, and not my kids. So the thing then is that uh, perhaps it is much better to illustrate uh, what archaeology is not. In order, to, uh, in order to define it. The first thing that um, I can say is that um, archaeologists do not play golf, <laughs> despite the fact that I have uh, this uh, very nice uh, uh, golf, uh, golf club. And also, archaeologists don't deal with dinosaurs, don't believe anything that you see in those Indiana Jones movies. Neither do archaeologists hunt for treasure like Jake and the Naval and Pirates. No, that's not, that's not, uh, that's not archaeology. Archaeology is um, a discipline um, that uh, studies uh, past societies using the remains which uh, the people will have um, left uh, behind. So in their day-to-day -day, um, living strategies, societies, um, uh, in, engage with uh, material and non-material worlds. They make uh, objects. Um, they uh, demarcate a space. And what archaeologists uh, do then is to uh, study the past, to understand um, knowledge sets, skills, innovations, beliefs. Uh, in a way, um, the experiences of, uh, of past uh, communities. So this is a copper ingot from uh, Palaborwa. It's known as um, a Lerale copper ingot. So what it does is that as an archeologist, if I study the chemistry of this, I will be able to identify the source of the ore and I can apply some scientific uh, techniques to uh, trace uh, or, and track the movement of um, commodities uh, on, the, on the landscape which also take us to ideas uh, such as um, logistics uh, and, and, and so on. But there is also a very interesting uh, challenge. Um, up to until uh, the uh, 1960s in African history, in um, African archaeology uh, and uh, related um, studies, um, there was this um, desire to demonstrate that, uh, you know, the Af Africa A had a past, and uh, that, um, that past was great, which uh, was uh, in a response to earlier assertions that uh, the continent uh, did, not have, uh, did not have a history. So we have um, a series of studies 
that demonstrated and continue to demonstrate that uh, the African past was great. You can see uh, these uh, stone uh, churches, La Libella, Ethiopia, quite stunning on the World Heritage List. Uh, the pyramids of Egypt. If you want to talk about globalization, Africa was quite uh, connected um, throughout, um, with particularly in the Indian Ocean region as well as um, in the um, in the Sahara. Side by side with that uh, great African past is the Africa of the day, which in some senses um, apologies for this uh, exaggeration or hyperbole which is a laboratory for chaos, uh, suffering as well as uh, poverty, um, conflict, you know, and also, you know, disease, starvation, and so on. So colleagues, uh, friends, how are we feeling at this point? The reason why I'm asking how are we feeling is that, as an archaeologist, the question that I, that confronts uh, me on a day-to-day -day basis is uh, that how do we say to those who have no bread that the African past was great? How do we say to them who have no jobs that, hey, the pyramids were built by Africans? How does that help us in the, in, in the present? So that is, that is, that is, um, that is a major, that is a major challenge and uh, which um, also shaped uh, my research from as early as um, 2005. So these are some of the uh, strands, strands or themes that permeate uh, through uh, my research um, when I try to say how can we make the African past uh, usable within the context of the present as well as the uh, future. So obviously uh, there is the need to uh, challenge uh, knowledge. Uh, facts like kings are no longer absolute. They cannot sustain themselves forever. So they must be, they must be challenged. And then we must also revise some concepts and perform uh, what I call a disruptive science with the understanding that disruption is also positive in some cases. Then we need to make sense of the past. And when we make that sense, we integrate the past um, into the present um, for the future. So the approach uh, that I use um, fuses African languages, philosophies, uh, archaeological in intuition, as well as um, the techniques uh, from the hard sciences and uh, interpretive flavor from uh, the uh, social sciences and um, humanities. So one of the um, examples of the projects that I've been working on is um, the archaeological of site of Great Zimbabwe which is on the uh, World Heritage uh, List and is believed to be um, the largest uh, pre-colonial structure in Africa uh, south of the Sahara. Great Zimbabwe was the capital of um, a state. Um, it was occupied between AD 1000 um, and um, AD 1700 with varying degrees of, uh, of intensity. So Great Zimbabwe also gave its name to the uh, country of uh, Great Zimbabwe. The reason why Great Zimbabwe is important is that um, since uh, this is um, Africa month, uh, Great Zimbabwe became uh, a symbol um, for African independence. And in 1980, when the country of Zimbabwe got independence, it gave its name um, to the country. However, there is also a lot of history and baggage associated with um, Great Zimbabwe. For example, initially, it was believed that uh, Great Zimbabwe was not built by locals but was uh, built by um, uh, foreign, uh, foreign people. So with uh, more uh, research, uh, thanks to uh, colleagues such as uh, Roger Summers, um, it was later acknowledged that Great Zimbabwe is uh, local in origin, but with no um, role for, uh, for locals. So we see a marginalization of um, African communities and to some extent uh, African knowledge. Um, there are some researchers who were bold enough to say that um, local narratives are inferior and um, as such uh, they, might, they must be uh, rejected. So we have the past, the um, experts such as myself uh, appropriating uh, the past to say, well, even though you live next door to Great Zimbabwe, whatever you think doesn't, make, uh, doesn't matter. Um, it's what the experts uh, say 
uh, matters. So what it did is that it also dislocated Great Zimbabwe from um, local uh, communities. So this is what uh, prompted uh, the archaeologist uh, Peter Gallic um, in 1982 to ask the question, where are the uh, native archaeologists? And uh, he was saying that um, unless the lion learns how to write, every story will glorify the hunter. Thank God my lion there can type, eh? <laughs> so what Gallic was um, alluding to was that um, there is need to balance perspectives, to have the one view from uh, the outside and also alongside that um, the view uh, from, the, from the inside. So I took up uh, Peter Gallic's um, challenge and uh, introduced ideas about um, concept revision to reimagine how Great Zimbabwe could have been, uh, um, could have uh, flourished uh, through, uh, through time. One of the most interesting things is that because of um, Great Zimbabwe's uh, place, particularly in the establishment of colonialism, Cecil John Rhodes' fascination with the place, and uh, treasure hunters' um, slav for, uh, for treasure from Great Zimbabwe, it was uh, destroyed uh, in the late 19th century and early uh, 20th century. So what happened is that um, in the 1960s, there was a moratorium on all excavations. So how do you then uh, go and uh, request uh, for, for permission to start um, new work? So what I figured uh, was quite uh, an easy way was to say, uh, the, obviously, if I had said I want to dig in the walls, I was not going to get any permission. So what I did is I looked at this map, uh, which is on the board there, and realized that there are some places outside the walls that had um, significant evidence of uh, human occupation. There were some of the places were used as car parks, camping grounds, and so on. So I said, well, can I dig in your car park? Then they said, ah, why are you wasting your money? What will you find? <laughs> so I went to dig into that uh, car park, uh, found uh, some gold and so on. And before, <laughs> before the end of the excavation, I was told, hey, you know what? You can actually go and dig on the hill. <laughs> so that was, that, was quite, uh, that was quite fortunate. And one of the uh, themes uh, that we were exploring is the idea of um, social class and um, the deep history of, uh, of inequality at, at Great Zimbabwe. Conventional interpretations argued that, look, um, these are imposing dry stone walls where are residences of the elite and uh, exotic objects such as uh, this uh, jade uh, teapot were also the preserve and the monopoly of the elite. And um, anything that is spectacular, you know, was for the elites. The commoners, they lived outside of the, of the walls and they lacked access to such goods. Could this hypothesis have withstood uh, scrutiny? So uh, we performed uh, new um, excavations uh, in unwalled and walled settlements. The idea was to change mindsets to say that uh, if we look at Great Zimbabwe as a cultural landscape, then we might be able to um, get different uh, types of, uh, of evidence. Uh, this is just uh, my, uh, a picture of me here. You know, sometimes when the going gets tough, you need to pray. So I was praying in the afternoon. What we also did was to um, perform an audit. Uh, what materials were recovered from different areas? So from the, the hill complex, uh, the valley enclosures, as well um, as the unwalled uh, settlements. And what we realized is that you could find um, materials uh, made of gold, um, those glass beads, um, and uh, local pottery across, across, across the site. So we showed that uh, in terms of access to these uh, materials, almost uh, everyone um, had uh, a, similar, a similar access. I guess the reason why I'm um, in this uh, picture is to uh, remind you that my other profession is that of a gold digger. <laughs> ah, yes, I know, I, I do, I do, I do, I do dig gold. <laughs> okay, so if we are finding that um, this, the materials which were previously associated with uh, the upper classes, you find them in unwalled um, settlements which were associated with uh, the commoners, what is going on? 
do we have a question of um, rich commoners? Uh, what is going on? So what we also realized is that um, we applied the technique of radiocarbon dating and realized that Great Zimbabwe expanded uh, with the time. There was a time when only the walls were occupied and there was a time when, only, when the walls and some and world settlements were occupied. And there was a time when the walls were totally abandoned and it was just the unwalled settlements, which uh, suggested then that uh, the way in which um, we were looking at class and inequality was um, totally uh, different. And that was published in the uh, journal uh, Antiquity. The other thing is that um, what was the nature of production within the Great Zimbabwe estate? How did the commodities um, circulate? What we then did was to combine techniques from remote sensing um, as well as uh, GIS and uh, came up with this uh, map, which is um, a resource uh, distribution a map of uh, Great Zimbabwe. We also added some um, geochemistry uh, to that to try and uh, track uh, the movement of gold. So for example, this gold has between 12 and 2% uh, silver which suggests that um, this is hard rock uh, gold, unlike uh, alluvial gold, which has um, a less uh, silver. So the conclusion uh, from the study of the political economy of Great Zimbabwe then was that um, production was quite um, uh, important. In fact, there are more local uh, commodities than there are the imports, and I will elaborate on the uh, significance of uh, that. Given that today all we do is consume and we don't uh, produce, and then hope that by some miracle we can create jobs. The other thing then is that um, this is Africa Month, and it is also important to celebrate the uh, important contribution that our mothers and sisters have made to the development of the African continent. So applying the techniques of um, archeological science, one of the uh, areas of research that I have done is to look into um, vessels that are known as uh, crucibles um, that were used uh, to uh, process gold, copper, and, and bronze. So in the ethnography, it is argued that uh, metallurgy was practiced by men and women were the, were the porters. There was no crossovers. So what we then realized was through our research was that you would find ports or vessels that on the outside look like a port, a broken port, but in the inside they've got residue which was used to process a metal. So given the insight from the anthropology and the ethnography, who made um, these uh, vessels then, was it men or was it, uh, or was it women? So we um, performed uh, some geochemical analysis, went into the SEM, uh, looked into the uh, fabric of uh, the, the clay fabric of uh, normal pots as well as uh, of those uh, crucibles. And then we realized that the clay was um, the same compositionally um, as well as uh, in terms of vessel um, uh, shaping techniques, it was the same. So the conclusion then was that um, the, what we were looking at is that perhaps the crucibles that we were looking at were a pottery which might have been made by women and ended up in a male domain, which is uh, metallurgy. So the conclusion then is that the story of Great Zimbabwe and Mapungubwe's success, particularly when you talk about gold and all those other things, um, is based on the a contribution of, uh, of women. So hashtag patriarchy must fall. <laughs> Building on uh, this, one of the um, themes that we have explored is the idea of um, early state uh, formation in Southern Africa, which is um, a very important um, topic uh, given that the traditional assumption or traditional knowledge assumed that uh, Mapungubwe in the uh, Shashi Limpopo was uh, Southern Africa's first state, which collapsed, um, leading to the rise of Great Zimbabwe, which collapsed, uh, leading to the rise of, uh, of Kami. So where are the other states? Don't ask me about uh, the Zulu states and so on. According to this model, they don't exist. <laughs> so. We are confronted with a situation of a tale of um, three states in 800 years. 
which also means that um, received wisdom in some cases uh, must be questioned, um, revised, and um, where possible improved uh, upon. So we took uh, one archaeological site that is situated closer to Mapungubwe. It's known as uh, Mapila. It, is, uh, it was believed to be uh, a provincial center under Mapungubwe. We performed uh, some uh, archaeological uh, work and realized that the indicators of um, what archaeologists refer to as a socio-political uh, socio complexity, uh, such as dry stone walls, um, exotic goods, as well as um, occupation on a different um, leveled uh, ground, were also represented uh, in this, uh, in this, uh, at this place. And we also did um, uh, some mapping. So one of the um, ideas is that uh, Mapungubwe was the first uh, in a series of um, uh, Great Zimbabwe and, 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 and Kami uh, because it had a stone walling, which is uh, at the top uh, uh, there. But then uh, side by side with this, um, with this map of Mapela, you can see that there is uh, quite a lot of um, stone walling. Uh, well, does size matter? Maybe it doesn't, maybe it does, but what it does uh, tell us is that if you have multiple places uh, on the landscape that have exactly the same uh, cultural attributes, maybe what we are talking about is um, a situation whereby um, Southern Africa had uh, multiple uh, pre-colonial states which might have been interacting, which might have been uh, fighting, and, um, and so on. So there was quite a lot of um, initiative and innovation. There is no need to restrict um, uh, Southern Africa and uh, Africa to only um, three uh, states. What was the role of imported objects in the development of past African uh, communities? I'm asking this question because I know that today we love bling so much. So how about um, if we look into the uh, deep history and see uh, what, we can, what we can get. So the thinking is that um, in Southern Africa, exotic goods are such as this, they were a symbol of wealth. They could be appropriated by the elites who could convert uh, their possession into political power. So this is how uh, Mapungubwe is assumed to have emerged. Great Zimbabwe is assumed to have emerged as well as Kami and other places. But if we rethink this, how does possession of one jet teapot such as uh, this one enable a king or a queen at Great Zimbabwe to control a territory that is 50,000 square kilometers in size? So, I mean, it's not the army, it's not um, you know, any, any, any other agents for enforcing our control. So this has led us to perform uh, some research, which also suggested that perhaps some local uh, production, such as the one that I mentioned um, earlier on, um, was uh, a better indicator of prestige uh, than these um, objects uh, from um, elsewhere. What is interesting is that um, in the good old days, uh, the people at a place uh, known as K2 next to Mapungubwe, they were importing uh, glass beads and uh, remelting them to uh, produce what are known as um, garden roller beads. And we also see that the people at um, Mapungubwe, they imported uh, those um, uh, ceramics, uh, whether directly or indirectly, uh, from, uh, from China. So perhaps today we need to learn that if we uh, import uh, objects, we perhaps need to improve uh, or modify those technologies. But more importantly, given that we always complain that the, some of the objects that we get uh, from China are not that strong, this is a lesson. For Mapungubwe, it lasted 800 years. Surely, we can do better today. <laughs> and also, Mapungubwe could make its own a bling. Not like you mine diamonds, they go to Antwerp, and then you buy them at the Shimansky shop uh, at, the, at the waterfront. The uh, emphasis on uh, exotic trade, on, on exotic commodities and long distance trade have had a negative effect that um, internal African trade has not been um, emphasized. 
So we don't know the connections between most of those places on the map, and that uh, darker circle in the center there assumed that communities to the north and uh, to the east were not interacting with each other. And yet we have uh, objects such as those um, cross-shaped um, copper ingots uh, that are on the basis of style and uh, chemical composition suggest that they were moved uh, at least 2,000 uh, kilometers. Um, and then we also have uh, those, um, those gongs. Uh, the vice chancellor mentioned music. I could have um, sent something for you, but I was told to keep things uh, formal. So we have to live with that. So these uh, metal gongs, they, their distribution starts from uh, the Ivory Coast right up to, uh, to the Mozambican coast. So they are a form of um, a global commodity you know, in, in, terms of, in terms of Africa, but that um, internal networking, we don't know much um, about it. Which brings me to the question, um, how big is Africa? <laughs> it's certainly not a country, <laughs> as this plaque is saying. And you can fit all these big countries um, into, uh, into it, um, which um, is um, important given that um, if uh, there was a viable trade in here, it has uh, some potential to uh, change uh, the, the fortunes of the, of the continent. Um, why do I have a picture of myself on this slide? Well, maybe that was to show you that once upon a time I was young. <laughs> the reality is that where I am standing is the site of um, the Berlin uh, Congress of 1884-85. This is where Bismarck <laughs> and the other Europeans gathered to sign the so-called uh, Berlin, uh, Berlin Congress. Um, I was fortunate enough um, years back to uh, convene uh, a class uh, on, um, uh, on uh, decolonial intellectualism, but looking at, um, at technologies so using that place as a, as, a, as a site. But the reason why I uh, am talking about the Berlin Congress is that if we take a, a step back and look at this Africa and um, look at uh, this uh, map, which is now subdivided into uh, different uh, countries, you now need uh, passports and visas to cross from one part of the country to another. Legend has it, say, has it that um, in Berlin, when the border between Malawi and Zambia was uh, drawn, a husband and a wife um, were relaxing on their bed, but suddenly it happened that the wife ended up in Malawi and the husband in Zambia. <laughs> Such is the arbitrary nature in which uh, these uh, boundaries were, were drawn. But the, um, when added to the uh, effect of uh, emphasis on um, external trade, external objects, and, and, and so on. This has uh, created a very uh, negative trop in uh, African uh, development studies, which is that um, development is only externally uh, driven. So you need aid you know, for, you to, for you to develop, and you need to get the assistance from someone else. And also the objects that we uh, consume, we also need to buy from China, we need to buy from elsewhere. We can't make them ourselves. So this is a legacy of, um, of the Berlin Congress. And it is much easier to meet a person or a colleague from Mozambique or from the DRC um, in France than it is to meet them in Africa. Connectivity is also quite a big uh, challenge. So these are some of the legacies of the Berlin Congress which we need to uh, if we are to learn from the fact that um, the map in the middle there, that Africa was uh, networked internally and integrated, perhaps we can do a little bit uh, more. I am going uh, towards uh, the, uh, the end now. So the, yes, I acknowledge that um, the African past was, um, was great. But the problem is that uh, there is a Shona proverb which says that we can't eat past glory. Also, we need to be able to do, um, we need to be able to do uh, something uh, today. So, I'm back to that slide where I said, I have shown you a glorious African past, great Zimbabwe, widely networked, and so on. And this is the reality of Africa's present. Some might call it um, its innovation, carrying bricks on a, uh, on a bicycle. That looks like a map of Africa, actually. 
and you know, carrying uh, a cow on a motorcycle, on a motorcycle, and well, uh, how good can it get? That is um, our ambulance. But if we are Capetonians, we should not laugh because not so long ago, uh, we were approaching uh, day zero and we are surrounded by two oceans. <laughs> Life is good, isn't it? <laughs> so the, 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 the key issue then is that um, what are we doing about that glorious African past that we have? What are we using it for? You know, does it help that we just say, you know, uh, the past was great, the past was great? when we are not um, improving our, our lives. So we can have um, some lessons, for example, from Great Zimbabwe, that uh, production is vital for any prosperity and sustainability, which is why Donald Trump is saying, let's impose uh, sanctions on China. Let us produce, because without production, you know, you can't, you can't, you can't be prosperous. And we perhaps need to moderate um, on our focus on consumption, or maybe choose um, wisely, and we need also to invest in our local our knowledge. There are so many great Zimbabweans, over a thousand of them, which means that that knowledge are transmitted uh, through time. And we also need to borrow techniques and technologies like what they were doing at K2 and improving them to ensure that the outcome is suited to our own needs. Then maybe uh, there is something um, about our education system um, why are we producing more accountants than artisans, engineers, farmers, and other job creators? I uh, can uh, assure you that uh, I have nothing against the accountants. If I wear my finance and entrepreneurship hat, they are my cousins. But the reality is that we don't create jobs. <laughs> so, and the challenge is that it is estimated that uh, by 2050, uh, half of the African population will be, will be youth. So where are the jobs going to come from if we are not um, focusing on, uh, on production? So maybe it is time to think about um, education that um, solves societal problems and uh, improve uh, people's life. And when I talk about relevant education, I'm not saying that we should, down, we should shoot down um, everything that is Western, Chinese, uh, and so on. It is about uh, people thinking about their local, reflecting on their local circumstances and coming up with a solution that, um, has, uh, that has got potential to develop uh, communities. So um, again, I emphasize the point that even from exotic artifacts, pre-colonial Africa was uh, selective, but um, today it seems like we are everyone else um, dumping a ground. So my... Um, my, my thoughts to uh, end this are uh, that um, as archaeologists, um, perhaps we should use our discipline to empower the present um, and also the future communities. So we must be thinkers and we must also be doers. Part of the problem in the past is that people have been talking and talking and talking and talking. But when are people going to, to act on their word? So perhaps now is the, uh, now is the time. So there is no substitute for fundamental research. So we need, we, need, we need fundamental research, all hands on the deck. Um, we also need to uh, consider uh, village science, what others refer to as um, indigenous knowledge systems. We need to uh, conserve uh, the past, and then we can use that past uh, to create um, opportunities. Uh, we can produce content for uh, corporate communication, uh, content for you know, televisions, uh, games based on archaeological sites and, uh, and so on. We can also do some research on the deep history of uh, food security. So um, small grains such as millets and, uh, and sorghum, they are highly nutritious, and some of them are native to Africa. So how come then that maize, which came from um, Latin America, is now the staple and is not uh, nutritious? Perhaps we need, to, we need to do something. There's also the issue of um, traditional medicines. Uh, there is that Chinese um, a medicine pharmacy in Newlands. What is wrong with us opening you know, uh, med pharmacies that dispense um, traditional medicine, where you can go and the Sangoma can give you your kg of herbs? In any case, we're thinking organic, isn't it? <laughs> Then the other issue is that um, we can also look at technology, 
uh, what technologies were used to manage, uh, for example, water in the past, uh, energy, and uh, develop, optimize uh, that um, for our purposes as well as the, as the future. And then we can use this information to plan uh, for the present. But what you might have realized is that um, conservation is archaeology, entrepreneurship is a separate discipline, uh, food security, it could be agriculture, it could be traditional medicine, ethnopharmacology, technology, that is uh, engineering. Everything is separated from, from everything. So perhaps we need to integrate all these things. But do we have the skills to uh, collaborate? And does our curriculum empower us to achieve this? The good thing is that uh, some of the projects that myself and colleagues are working on, they have these elements and they are aimed to uh, come up with um, tangible um, uh, deliverables. So there is an oven which is used uh, to make um, uh, some traditional uh, popcorn. Um, myself uh, and a team of, uh, of, of, of engineers, what we are doing is uh, optimizing the technology that is employed on pressure cookers to see if we can not pop um, the traditional popcorn in a very, in a very easy way. So, 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 I mean, I'm not an engineer, but those guys are engineers. I just give them engineer, I mean, some ideas, and then we come up with, uh, then we come up with something. Is it possible for us to uh, come up with uh, uh, something? So maybe um, in uh, towards are going to the end. I think um, um, some you know grows. You know, people give them when I'm close, when they are close to retirement. But I don't think I'm anyway near near at that point uh, soon. So I don't think that a conclusion um, is uh, necessary. But maybe uh, let me just uh, leave you with uh, the remark that. Uh, what we need to think about is, uh, you know, what can we do uh, for Africa and not, uh, you know, what can others uh, do uh, for Africa? We are all African citizens, so let's use our knowledge uh, from, from our past uh, to try and uh, ensure that um, we improve uh, the, uh, the lives. If you think that what I was talking about is a fairy tale, uh, a kind of uh, make-believe um, scenario, then you haven't heard about this proverb. If you think you are too small to make a difference, you haven't spent a night with a mosquito. <laughs> Colleagues and uh, friends, I hope you have enjoyed your flight with us. Bye-bye. <laughs>
And <coughs> they, uh, then, then I did find someone at uh, A-level who attested to Shadrach's excellence in Shona. Uh, they nicknamed him Timber. Uh, for those who are birders, Timber is a bird called Cisticola natalensis. Um, a very beautiful bird, but very agile. Um, he also excelled very well in history to the extent of earning himself by 1995. That was, he was doing his A-level. He was referred to as Professor Peacock. Now he's a professor. <laughs> and <coughs> he, he, he said to have uh, loved presenting in, fr in front of the class, whereas everyone else was going in front of the class with cues of what they were going to say. He would just go with no cues, but he was fond of using the big words. Words like bombastic, these are some of the words. That <laughs> <laughs> so after his A-level, he then enrolled at the University of Zimbabwe and proceeded, as we had uh, earlier on, to UCL for master's and, and PhD. So Shadrach the professional is viewed as one of the finest hands and brains uh, in archaeology and heritage management. His growth has been phenomenal considering that his achievements have been accomplished in a relatively short space of time of less than 15 years. He's surely destined for greater heights. Like he said, he's not yet old, he's not concluding, he's actually continuing. His peers attest to his hard work, bravery, critical and independent thinking, and passion for his work. I think some of this passion was demonstrated uh, this evening. Uh, he currently runs the only pyrometallurgy laboratory in Africa, one of its kind. This is attesting to some of the good work that he's doing. His work on Great Zimbabwe, we have seen snippets of that, and related sites has pushed for revision of how we understand the development of site systems in Southern Africa. During one conference, prefacing his first challenge against colonial beliefs on interpretations of Great Zimbabwe and Zimbabwean culture in general, he had this to say, I quote, open quotes, uh, this is your captain, this is your captain uh, Chirikure speaking. Please ensure that your, seat, your seats are in upright position and that your seat belts are securely fastened. What I'm, 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 I'm about to present may cause some turbulence. <laughs> he was going to challenge what has been the standing uh, paradigms of that time. So it is out of his good work and ethical, uh, uh, ethics and hard work that he has continued to earn nicknames and currently his uh, professional friends and students uh, call him Mondoro. In our language, Mondoro means the spirit of the lion. You can see from what he has touched in, 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 in his speech that he, um, he has touched many aspects. I'm sure you agree with the, uh, his achievements. Uh, his professional uh, colleagues take him as a master predator on data, ideas, and frameworks. Professor Chikure uh, has uh, people at heart as he thrives to make archaeological research relevant to ordinary people and the marginalized. He advocates for decolonized archaeology, which should accommodate ordinary people and their voices in the interpretation of the past. As we witness today, uh, Prof. Chikure's painstaking intellectual labor brings to life that history of technology, Africa's and the planet's, in many ways, in many few ways, uh, others have done. Even with all these accomplishments that we are talking about, Professor Chirkure, it is rumored that uh, one of his uh, manuscripts on changing the paradigms was rejected, and one of the uh, and part of the comments read, "This is immature, adolescent stuff." To which he responded, uh, "I quote: Leave the teenagers out of this." There are many teenagers who are much smarter than me. Please deal with what is before you. <laughs> In their field, this manuscript is one of the most cited currently. So this actually attests to really the contestation of the ideas that they were bringing. Chirkula also has got a social life. He just doesn't whiz through just the academic. The love story of Shadrach and Geraldine is one for the movies. Theirs was a love at first sight. Meeting in a passenger overloaded pickup truck, squashed with other passengers, and behold, 
Demonstrating his finest in conversation skills and predatory tenacity, Shadrach managed to extract name and contact details from this beautiful girl. <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> the rest is history as uh, Madame sits here uh, as the spouse, the friend, the soulmate, and the mother of their sons. <clears throat> uh, he's kept on friends. Uh, no Shadrach is a, uh, a people's person. His generosity is expressed through contribution during, for those who have been long enough in Cape Town, during happy hours in, uh, you know, there's a place in, uh, in Mowbray which has now been turned into a hostel where there was a place called Champs. He doesn't drink, but Shadrach would sit with people but contributing to buying the beers. So this attests to his uh, generosity. Uh, in the cooking department and modern dancing, uh, Professor Chirukure is found wanting. <laughs> <coughs> However, he is known to respond considerably very well to traditional African music. I think this, uh, this is due to, given to where he spends most of his time, this could be the, the reason. It is rumored that at some stage, Professor Chirukure even tried stand-up comedy. And, <laughs> and sadly, that was the time when Trevor Noah was on his rise. And this really forced him to concentrate on academia. That's why now, to date, he has over 100 publications, five books, and has trained several masters and PhD students. Uh, on life, uh, lifestyle, Professor Chirkure is a regular jogger, doing 20 to 30 kilometers every Saturday. Uh, he has sent an invite to me. I'm still to honor that. <laughs> I'm not sure whether I will survive that. <clears throat> he has tried, uh, he has done, uh, gone to jogging after having tried and failed volleyball, I'm told. So to, to end uh, my speech, uh, my, my vote of thanks, um, I would like to uh, recite uh, Professor Chirkure's daughter. Uh, this is actually an auspicious occasion. Uh, he happens to come from my totem as well. And it's only recited when there's something that we have done that is very... Uh, the, the family acknowledges that this is uh, something that is wonderful, you have done very well. He comes from the, what we call the Gumbo Majgira Pashes totem. I will do it in Shona, uh, unfortunately. So this is uh, just to thank him for the work that he's done. So, Mazita Gumbo, Mazita Senyu Majgira Pashe, Negona Chitova, Heka Nichiro Namuto, Vane Ushe Uri Mungo, Shava Uru Yaka Pambagona, Gararama sangu chipauro che mafuta, maita kodza muto, chikodza mandara. Maita vari masakajga, maita vari njaidza. Vari miri kwa nyazidzi vari wiru. Zuri mutumbwe vari chikomo cha mabwashe. Chise masambiri. Chipwasha mongo vane gidiri ririmura, mombe, hiriri, hiriri, hiriri. Chitova. Asante sana engo sikakulu thank you Thank you very much Shadrach for the for the amazing lecture it was wonderful it's always good to see you in action and congratulations on your professor professorship we are delighted to have your caliber in our midst, in your lecture. You, you, you took us on a journey, and it was wonderful. You opened up the dark corners. You reminded us that we have a great past, but you also challenged us about a future, a great future to build. Now, I want to challenge you as, you as we welcome you to the professoriate, that there's responsibilities that come with being a full professor at the university. Not only that, you have to attend Senate. <laughs> and we don't have to struggle with quorum. But, but it also means that the privileges of young academics are a thing of the past for you. You are the one who will create them. You are the one, one of those people who will, who will contribute to giving us a good name, not only with the work that you've done already, but with the work that you're going to do. And as you give us a good name as a university, you also will give the continent a good name. So thank you very much for choosing us for your scholarship. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in congratulating. Shaka.
Thank you. Thank you. You, you are such an amazing audience. This is the second standing ovation. It's amazing. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you. Thank you also to Geraldine, Tawana, Tafara, and the other Ta that I forgot. Um, uh, and I have to say, Shadrach, thank you to Geraldine for approving the lecture because I'm sure it wouldn't have, been, it wouldn't have come here if she didn't say yes, you can go, from what you told us. So thank you, thank you to them and thank you to you colleagues for joining us for this lecture. We really appreciate you for joining us. We hope you enjoy Africa Month. There's food in the African culture. We don't do these things without food. So as you go out, please help us finish the food that we ordered to celebrate. Um, Shadrach's professor, thank you very much for, for joining us. The procession is going to leave the hall without music, but you will imagine it. Mm. <laughs> Don't worry, next time we're going to organize this better, but we're going to go out without music. You can imagine it and then join us outside for, for, for the video.